Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And today on our show, I'm delighted to introduce you to Lauren Lane Powell. In April of 2012, Lauren was diagnosed with stage 3 ovarian cancer. Thankfully, being a spiritual person, Lauren quieted her mind and asked the question how to deal with it. Her story is amazing, uplifting, and inspiring. Today, Lauren is a singer, author, and a motivational speaker. In fact, she's led workshops and seminars to well over 150 groups. Her book is titled, Holy Shift, Everything's a Gift, A Spirit-Led Journey Through Illness into Wellness. Lauren considers it a sacred honor to share her music and her healing techniques with the world. Lauren Lane Powell, a warm welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you so much, Sanders. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's super nice to have you. I didn't know too much about you, and I was doing some searching, and I... I'm filled with so much love and inspiration and laughter and music right now. So I didn't want to give away too much of your story in the introduction because I think it's valuable that you share it. So anyways, welcome. Where are you coming to us from this morning? I am coming to you from Bloomington, Indiana. Bloomington, Indiana. We're both on the East Coast time zone. I'm in Massachusetts. And where do we start? Where do we start with your story? Oh, my goodness. How about before it all started? Yeah, let's do that. I was traveling around the country teaching people how to sing for 12 and a half years. I had developed a workshop called Sing for Your Soul after I was working with individuals with um, hour-long voice lessons every single week. And I recognized that I was using the same techniques for everybody. And I went to the Wheatland Music Festival in 1994, submitted an idea for a vocal music workshop, because I recognized they had every other workshop under the sun. Mm-hmm. I mean, flogging, guitar, fiddle, everything, but nothing for the voice. And when 100 people came to my very first workshop, I knew that this was something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Great. Sing for Your Soul evolved into Harmonies of Healing when I recognized that when people started singing, usually for the very first time, believing initially that they were tone deaf, and recognize that there was no such thing as tone deafness, their bodies started to heal. Their minds started to heal. Their relationships started to heal. It was crazy. <laughs> Can you give some examples of that? I've never heard of anything like oh this. Oh my gosh, yes. One person in particular told me that she was able to leave a volatile relationship because she found her voice. Who knew? Another woman, with the help of a doctor, took herself off of asthma medication because she learned how to breathe. Doctors started coming to me to learn how to sing, to teach their patients how to breathe right. It was crazy. Um, I had stutterers come to me, and once they learned how to sing and how to use their voice as fluidly as they are singing, they stopped stuttering as they I worked with a man with cerebral palsy, and as soon as he started to breathe, and use his core muscles to speak from, like we sing from, his voice started to normalize and started to be a whole lot more understandable. And this continued on and on and on. One memory I have is singing with a woman who could not get up to the high notes. And finally I said, just do a sigh and do a, "Ah!" and she realized, oh my God, I never screamed. And it was so therapeutic for her to recognize where that baby's yell needed to come from that never was let out. And vocalizing, singing became so much deeper than just singing songs or singing for fun. It became a way of therapy, a way of breathing deeper, and a way of healing. And that's why I took it on the road for 12 and a half years. I was all over the country doing this work, and I just loved it. Yeah, I can see why. That's really something. It really yeah. piqued my interest in the singing, too. <laughs> it, was, it was just absolutely awesome. So imagine my surprise when in 2012, I was 50 years old. I had my 50th birthday on September 2nd, so I just turned 56, mind you, a couple of days ago. Happy birthday, belated. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I had reached the pinnacle of my perfect health. 
I was the weight I wanted to be. My tummy was flat. My diet was good. I was exercising. I was taking care of myself on the road. I was loving all of my life. And six months later, I was diagnosed with stage 3C ovarian cancer. And I was notified that my ovaries were as large as softballs. And the oncologist who um, examined me in Pensacola, Florida, I was actually on tour when I was diagnosed, believe it or not, put the fear of God in me and said, you get those things out of there or you will die. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And it wasn't even a low enough number that I could have played with it myself and tried my own kind of healing and toned and worked with my diet. It was way beyond that already. I didn't know at the time, but the normal CA-125, which is the ovarian cancer test, is supposed to be from 0 to 35. Mine was well over 2,000, like 2,460 or something crazy. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't want to know what that meant. I didn't up online I didn't study the statistics or any of that stuff or survival rate for goodness sakes had I I may have driven off a bridge on my way home but I knew myself and I knew that this was an opportunity and as soon as I asked not why me because I always heard why not you right <laughs> what I heard instead when I turned within and asked what do I do with this I heard, congratulations, you have everything you need to go through this. You've graduated. Wow. Did you have a spiritual background? Because I don't know. Thank God I did. I have been a unitic. I've been in unity for... I have never heard unitic. <laughs> isn't that fun? <laughs> I have been a member of Unity Church, Unity Community Center now, uh, since 1984. So I have had my spiritual feet wet and have been a seeker for a number of years. And on the road, I got to practice all of these principles of being happy for no reason, mm -hmm. working on my inner prosperity consciousness, working on my ability to, to listen to my inner spirit as to where to go next. So I have managed to fine tune a relationship with my inner spirit before the cancer dance. So when I was diagnosed, I was fully entrenched with, okay, God, now what do I do? Mm. How and, about, I don't mean to interrupt, but how about a belief in the afterlife? Is that part of unity? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not only a belief in the afterlife, but a belief in being able to communicate with our spirits as our guides and as our friends and between the second and third cancer dance yes I've had it three times now wow. I'm now an expert on chemotherapy <laughs> I call it chemo dreamo wow <laughs> it changes everything but between cancer dances two and three both mom and dad passed on a year apart wow and I knew then that I had survived my own dance to help them cross. And in the middle of my grief, when I would ask, you mean I survived my cancer for this? I would hear all the time, oh yes, absolutely. And now I get to cultivate a new relationship with mom and dad on the other side. And dealing with the possibility that I might die a couple of times in the last five years has really let me know that there is no death. It's just a releasing of the body. And the other way I am connected with um, the celebration of crossing over and of the death experience itself is that because of my own cancer dance, I had been posting uh, an original song every single day on Facebook as part of my guidance to get my music out there. If I'm terminal, if I'm going to die in a year, which thank God I wasn't, but if I had been, what would be the most important thing I needed to do for myself and for the world before I left this body? And it, the main message was to get the music out there. So I started posting a song a day on Facebook. Someone in San Diego saw one of my songs, heard one of my songs, and Facebooked me right away and said, that's a beautiful song. Could we sing that in our threshold choir? 
Wow. And I'm like, sure, what's a threshold inquire? <laughs> well, I learned that there was already one established, a chapter here in Bloomington. I met the folks. I am now seeped deeply into the threshold choir culture. We sing at bedside for hospice. Wow. It's the most sacred way I have ever used my voice. It is just incredible to be present in a place while someone is trying to relax deeply enough to be able to let go of their body mm -hmm. to their side. And that's what this music provides. We practice, of course, en masse in a group, but we only go to bedside two or three at a time and sing in three-part harmony a cappella. It's, it's incredible. Well, you've left me speechless. Um, you know, I, I remember when my dad passed and the fear and everything that was present in the room with my siblings and I, and to have had a choir there and embraced it like he's just crossing the, sh the threshold exactly. uh, would be a whole different kind of experience. Well, I knew because of my threshold experience and I knew because of my mom's upbringing with my sister and I both singing in harmony mm. that that was something that my sister and I were going to be able to do for my mom if we were available and if it was okay with her. And sure enough, my sister and I, I've got to share the rest of this story. This is part of what you need to hear, I think. When my mom was passing, my brother-in-law, my sister's husband, was down and was coming into the patio on the phone in tears. And we just assumed he was talking about mom to somebody. Mm -hmm. And he hung up the phone and said, oh, my God, so-and-so just crossed over. And it was completely unexpected. And learned that he took his own life. Oh. And my sister had an intuition. She said, honey, you go home and be with your friends or with your, with your kids. They are not expecting this. We know mom is crossing. So mom, my sister and I sat on either side of my mom. And my sister in her wisdom said, mom, there's a young man who just crossed over who may need some help, who doesn't know that even though he took his own life, he is still with God, and he still deserves the light. If you have anything to do on the other side, this might be yours to do. And we sang our angel flying song, Once Upon a Time I Used to Fly with Angels. And when I got to the bridge, when I'm an old woman preparing for my rest, Will I see my family of angels from the past? Smiling faces tell me that I'll not be alone. Winged graces beckoning, they'll come to take me home. And Mommy gave us her last breath. And we kept singing. It was that swift. Wow. And Mom was a server in life, mm -hmm. as now she is in death. It was almost as if she was waiting for us to know that she had a job to do and that it was okay. And things like that have happened ever since. We've kept getting nudges and acknowledgments of who is over there waiting for her, for example. And all the healing that we have done in our forgiveness work years ago that has allowed this now to be so loving. I think, Sandra, the, the biggest thing that we were blessed with knowing is that because of our inner work, because of all the counseling I went through, because of the uh, forgiveness work that I started doing by myself, for myself supposedly, that changed everything and everybody around me for the last maybe 15 or 20 years through the unity movement. My family had no issues left. I mean, they died without stuff hanging over our heads. It's remarkable. And I think that is why the clarity now that I can speak to them, that I know they're still around, because there's no stuff, there's no ick 
left. And it's about healing in this life so that we can be clearer with our loved ones in the next that I'm learning more and more about. Wow, there's so much to talk to you about, but might as well do what's present here, which is the forgiveness work. Could you talk a little bit more about that? And is that something you did on your side that people didn't have to do it on their side? Because I think all of us have unresolved stuff. Uh, obviously, we lots of things we can forgive ourselves for, but forgive others. But it, it sounds so intriguing that to deal with that stuff while we're here will provide yeah. a... Yeah. Well, the I have found so many wonderful tools. I've actually started giving a, a forgiveness workshops before I got sick. And there's a radical forgiveness I've used. It's a great book. Um, the biggest, best tool that I know that I've used myself is through my own vocalization. We are very familiar with the primal scream, I'm sure, from the 70s where the counselor would sit me in a chair opposite an empty chair and have me yell and scream at mom or dad as a child, mm-hmm. things I could you know, express then. And while that looked good on paper, it should have worked better than it really did. And what I'm learning is that when people yelled and screamed, they used their throat muscles, their adult learned muscles, and it only got to their adult core muscles. It didn't get down to where the kid stuff is. Mm-hmm. But when I use my vocal muscles from the very core that infants yell and scream from perfectly, all of that changes. So when I am faced with an issue, let me bring you a very concrete example. Okay. I, I was in a, a conference of musicians that I didn't feel connected with. I didn't feel like I fit in. And I know from the Course in Miracles and from Unity that nothing that upsets me is truly what's really upsetting me. I'm never upset for the reasons I think I am, Mm -hmm. is what the phrase says. So knowing that, knowing it probably has nothing to do with this situation, I took myself away. I put myself in my van outside somewhere and just kind of went into the silence. And I got good at asking the question, when did I first feel like I didn't fit in? And as I took a deep breath, it was my mom's boyfriend after their divorce, after my mom and dad's divorce, who was with her for seven years, who brought violence into our lives for the first time. He was very volatile. He knocked me through a door once. Wow. And we watched him brutalize my mom. Well, I had been through multiple layers of forgiveness with him over and over and over again. And this was just another layer. But this was the seed it seemed to be. Because as I was crying and yelling, you didn't accept me. How dare you not accept me? And how dare you take my mommy away from me? And all the things that a kid would feel. How dare you hit my mom? How All that stuff. And I was crying and yelling. And I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. With the breath from the gut. Ha! Ha! way down here because that then is what churns up all of those child feelings from the core that I don't even know I'm still hanging on to. That's what makes this such a wonderful tool. Then I get to, I forgive you. I forgive you for being such an SOB. (laughs) I forgive you for being so violent. I forgive you for being so needy. I forgive you for being so brutal. And even though my brain may not believe it yet, saying those words seems to lift it up and out of my body. And now there's a void. There's an emptiness that only love can fill. But this time, that was not the end of it. Because I heard from him from the other side from this man, who I used to refer to as the son of a bitch that beat my mom. Yeah, of course. He has a name. His name is Dave. He is now one of my angels. Because right after this, he said, you didn't accept me either, Lar. Nobody called me Lar but him. I knew it was him. And I started crying all over again. 
and I got to turn it in on myself. I hate you, Lori. I wasn't Lauren then. I hate you, Lori, for being so nasty to Dave. I hate you, Lori, for not understanding that mom needed a male partner, that you were not enough. I hate you, Lori, for not being enough for your mommy. I hate you, Lori, for lashing out at Dave. I hate you, Lori, for not being enough. And then, of course, I forgive you. I forgive you, Lori. I forgive you. I forgive you. And I turned on the radio, and Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run was on. And this was a runner, and that was his favorite song. And it was like <clears throat> sealing the deal. It was absolute. This was it. This was the end of the stuff that we needed to go through. And I felt so clean and so free, and at the same time, full of intrepidation because now I couldn't share in my mommy's story. I couldn't hate him anymore. I couldn't play in her sandbox. And it was a week or so before I could tell her that I had forgiven Dave. Mm. But when I finally did, she heard it in my voice that something was going on. She's so intuitive. And I said, Mom, I've got to tell you, I finally forgave Dave. And she said, oh, little darling, maybe now I can forgive him too. Wouldn't you know, it was he that was on the other side waiting for her when she crossed over. And he let both my sister and I know that without this layer of forgiveness, he would never have been able to be there. Very interesting. Your sister intuitive too? Oh, yes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing Dave came through just in messages into your mind, sort of oh, speak. Oh, man. Well, more than that, actually, songs happened on the radio that were we hadn't heard for years and years and years and that normally wouldn't have been on the radio. I mean, weird stuff. Isn't that mind-blowing when that happens? Uh, my, my high school friends came to visit my mom on her deathbed and brought over Magnolias. And one of the songs from Poco that Dave always listened to was called Sweet Magnolias. And my sister and I just kind of looked at each other like, you're kidding me. And sure enough, the next song that was on the radio, that song never plays on the radio. That song was on the radio. And the end line, the last line of that song was, you're the best I ever had. And that's what my mom needed to hear. That's what we needed to hear. Mm -hmm. For sure that Dave was waiting for her. Because my sister and I were bemoaning the fact that mom didn't have a partner at the end of her life. She didn't have a loved one to be with her at her bedside. We were it. Right. And Dave said, oh, no, no, no. I'm right here. For those listening that are, so many people, Lauren, are looking for signs from their loved ones. And I always say, or we say, ask. And, <clears throat> excuse me, to ask for music and song and messages and music, it's so interesting because I don't know how it all works from the other side, but ask and you shall receive. I've been driving down the road and I hear lyrics in the song that it's like, I know that those that's the message I need to hear. Or like you said, there's a song that is related to a certain person that's never played on the radio anymore. Exactly. Or it was your song and it'll come on. You know, so it's a it's a really great gift. So Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I wow. see them in, in butterflies and I ask, Is this you? And if I get a little nudge, I know. If I don't, it's just a butterfly. Mm. But I'm getting more and more comfortable with Asking and trusting that intuition, and that is a learned skill, I think. If people don't know how to trust their intuition or even what their intuition is, believe it or not, when they start singing and vocalizing from the core muscles and strengthen their physical core, their intuitional core gets strengthened as well. Guess why? Why? <laughs> when I start connecting my breath, as I speak even from the core, which is what I'm doing now. I'm tightening my stomach muscles, I'm pushing out the breath, I'm thinking more about how I speak instead of what I say. Consequently, what I say comes physically, intuitionally from my core. It's not from the neck up any longer. As those muscles can be trusted now to speak my truth physically, they're also getting stronger to feel the truth physically because it's all coming from the same central part of the body, not the neck and head. Isn't that curious? 
It is. I'm like, wow, this is something I've never heard of. And I, I, it makes sense. Yeah. So for your listeners out there, just to get a clue of what the heck I'm talking about, mm -hmm. taking a low, deep belly breath, which means puffing your belly out as you inhale. It might feel a little foreign at first, but this is the way we breathe when we sleep. And that's what showed me how much more of a natural way of breathing this really is. So as I breathe in and puff my tummy out, now the air is all the way in my lungs instead of just the top third. Now try this. It feels ridiculous. It looks even sillier. It brings me to my childlike self because of the silliness, but I cannot go without those core muscles. So it immediately connects the breath and the voice to the bottom body muscles. Now those muscles are engaged. Now with just that simple act of that silly motorboat, I can breathe and relax and ask, okay, what do I need to know now? And I can listen to my gut. And I start getting those feelings and those intuitions of what's coming or what might be mine to do or say next. Very cool. I've had this on mute and I've been trying to make the motorboat noise. <laughs> it's not working so well. So I might need a little, a little well, practice if, there. If your lips are a little bit tight, you don't mm -hmm. know how to loosen them yet, that could be part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. You may want to squeeze the corners of your lips together with your fingers to add a little bit of unnatural flexibility. <laughs> Even better, Sandra. Stick out your tongue. It's messy, but it worked. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Laughter feels very good this morning to me. I'm spitting all over the camera, so excuse me. Spit happens when you're doing that, by the way. Spit can't happens, and your book's called Holy Shift. I think you're you're just great. Can't, so, first of all, let's, let's just tie up this forgiveness thing. You know, and I really believe forgiveness, whether somebody's alive or... Oh, it's crossed never... over it's all good but i can see you know there's you know, gosh as human beings i you know we, gosh it's a roller coaster ride i've had times in my life that i was complete with everybody forgiveness was there only love was present and you know it's not so like that right now but it's just like at any time we can do this but i i know from the past when things have been complete like that that there's like a blank canvas that mm -hmm. I'm free to create, to do anything, that nothing's looming over me, you know, I, so, yeah, and I also, it's nice to know it, um, it's something I can do myself, I don't have to hunt down people uh, to forgive them, you know, so to speak, you know. Or you don't have to have years and years of psychotherapy. Yes. You right, know, right. the therapy is great, but even talk therapy, I've learned, we're just retelling our stories over and over and yes, over again, Right. not necessarily getting rid of them. So the idea of making friends, making peace with my unforgiveness, with my anger, with my anguish, and bringing them into the light through forgiveness may be a very nebulous idea, but once we start practicing it, it becomes very tangible because of that clean slate idea. Mm -hmm. But every time, not but, and, every single time I have gone through what I call now lovingly the primal purge as opposed to the primal screen, every time I do a primal purge, I am so clean and clear that I experience miracles, plural, every single time after. Really? I started writing them down. They were so overt in my face. And some less overt, but if I hadn't been writing them down, I, have, I may have missed them. Right. But I believe that it clears out so much of uh, maybe a particular blockage every time I do that act of forgiveness that then something else can flow in in its place that's so good and so rich and so full that I never would have been able to attract otherwise. Mm. And who doesn't like miracles? Oh, Lauren, I want to go back to the beginning of your story. I know there's listeners here who are dealing with life-threatening illnesses um, have been diagnosed terminally. Uh, I know there's a lot of people here that have a loved one who is by their side or close by that's fearing death. For you, 
when you first got diagnosed? What what did you do when you tuned in and got the message, you know, to use your music, have fun with the cancer, dance with it? I love how you say dance. <laughs> um, yeah. But in like, what ad- advice could you give for people going through that? How, or if, just maybe tell your story because um, you've come a long way. You've had the dance a few times and you haven't let it pull you down or doesn't seem to. No, and even at the time, it was interesting that when mom was going through her cancer dance, I recognized I was so much more filled with anxiety than I was when I was going through my own. Yes. And it was very curious. I thought because I had gone through my own, it was going to be easier. And that's why I had gone through my own because I was going to be able to help her. And everyone is so individual. And even though mom said, I would like for me, for you to be my chemo coach, she was very resistant for whatever reason. And I I learned very quickly just to be what she needs and allow her to be her. And I can make all kinds of suggestions to people, but just to know that it's a very individual Mm -hmm. act of illness or of death, and at the same time, there are multitudinous things we can do for ourselves. And for me, the whole idea is not necessarily staying happy because that's not always possible. Right. When it's not possible to allow myself to go down that rabbit hole. And mom and I did often when I was first diagnosed. Mom, what if I die? I don't know, honey. Let's go there. And she and I together would pre-grieve a possible not-so-healthy outcome. Wow. As it died. Yeah. And then, now that we have that out of our system, let's get back to healing. Because it's pervasive. It's in our bodies. If we don't express it, it can take us down and it can be part of our illness. So why not get it out on the table? Why not sing about it? Why not yell and scream about it and then get back to healing? So while it's not always possible to be positive, I use the negative situations for those kinds of releases. Then to get back to positivity, how can I laugh? How can I have fun with this? Because that was my constant directive from spirit. Have fun with it. How do you have fun with cancer? Well, you'll learn. First of all, I changed the spelling of the word. I mean, C-A-N-C-E-R has so much vibration, so much negative connotation. We don't even want to use the word. We say the C, right? C word, yeah. Yeah. So changing the spelling. I had to think of what rhymes with cancer. The word answer came to mind immediately. Mm -hmm. So I spelled cancer with the word answer in a capital A with a little bitty C. Some people see it as C answer. My sister called it answer. I mean, how desperate can I feel when I'm talking about having answer? It feels like I've got a hiccup, right? Right. (laughs) So it even made the word playful. Well, after my first surgery, I was released, I believe, a little earlier than I should have been. Some bowel was nicked or pried off an infected ovary. I was full of sepsis. And they had to helicopter me from Bloomington to Indianapolis. And I thought I was going to die. And when I was in that helicopter, I said, I'm okay. I'm ready to go if that's my time. Please take care of my mommy because she's not ready for me to go yet. But when I came out of it and I realized I wasn't going to die, I had to tell my dad or somebody that I couldn't be brave anymore. I can't do this on my own. And my father in his wisdom says, Honey, you don't have to do it by yourself. Let us be brave for you. And that was the biggest amount of surrender I think I've ever felt. But I woke up with a colostomy bag. Wow. I had a hole in my stomach from which I pooped. Mm -hmm. How weird. And I said, okay, spirit, what the heck do I do with this? And I heard those words again. Have fun with it. Yeah, right. (laughs) Well, 
I named her Lucy. Hmm. I made her some kind of a person or personified her. And somehow that made the situation feel different. And when I recognized that cancer, death, illness, all of this is simply a part of life, it got easier. Oh, well, I think I can do this. Huh, maybe even dying's not so bad. And so I asked, how do I do this? How would I die? And when I was concerned about it and a little freaked out, about possibly having a terminal diagnosis, sure. Spirit said, go there, practice, pretend. So for two or three months, I practiced dying. I wondered what it would feel like, which is why I sent you that particular song. Music came out of me about my own demise and being on the other side. And after I went through my own experience about what it might feel like, what it might mean leaving mom and dad behind because they weren't gone yet, I got uh, a much deeper sense of peace with it all. And then the music started to come about crossing over that gave me an even deeper sense of peace. And all of a sudden, that willingness started to emerge from my core. And I'm learning that just being willing means maybe I don't have to go there. But being willing is, yeah, I'm willing to see what's next in my life, which might mean death. And death is just a part of life. It's just an extension. I'm not going anywhere. My energy just leaves the body. Huh. I think I can handle that. And I started healing. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. And how is your health now? It's awesome. I am claiming that. I stopped my last chemotherapy in March, March 20th. Four months later, my CA-125 had increased from 4 to 33. It's still under the 35 mark. I could have another occurrence, but I am not but and I'm living every day as if I'm going to live forever and at the same time as if I'm going to die tomorrow, which is a very interesting balance. Mm -hmm. My job now is to stay happy, to stay in meditation, and to use my body as an experiment of sorts just to see how this happiness, how this alignment, how the meditation, how a deeper layer of my prayer work might affect my body. Because I have done absolutely everything else. I've done the diet, I've done the oils, I've done, you know, mm -hmm. and that has kept me healthy through chemo for sure. But if I'm might be looking at yet another, a fourth round, which I'm not convinced I'm going to have to do. Mm -hmm. But if, how can I do it even better? How can I do it differently yet? I am now a chemo expert. I don't think I need to do that again. But is there a possibility that by the work that I'm doing now, the, the, more internal work, the staying in my peace, the staying happy, using my singing bowls again. Maybe that can help me stay healthier longer. And the numbers won't, won't continue to go up. I love that you're on the adventure of it all. Oh, I yeah. love that you share it all. And quite possibly and probably everything that you've done, you've shared and Maybe that's just part of the dance, you know? Yeah. You get to learn it, you get to share it. Okay, on to the next. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know what yeah. I've decided, Sandy? Mm -hmm. If it's time for me to go, I mean, within a year or so, 
I'm not thinking anytime soon just because of the way my history goes with the numbers. But if I only have a year, six months to a year, say, how fascinating and wonderful could it be to use my ministry even in my death? Right. Publicize that, to have that on camera, to have how to die a different death, you know? <laughs> How to do it with song and dance and party and, you know? Yeah, there, there's, there's some cultures that celebrate death. And, <laughs> and I think everything that I've learned and everything that I feel, you, I, I would love to see planet Earth that people lived their lives fully. People had forgiveness. They knew the bigger picture that we go on, that we're just energy and energy can never die. And so we play full out in our life that we keep death on the horizon meaning okay I know I'm gonna lose this body sooner or later what else do I need to do with it you know and then that final moment that we close our eyes on planet earth that we don't close them in fear but instead we know and we're confident that we're gonna open them again surrounded by our loved ones there's going to be a parade for us everybody's going to be cheering us across the finish line you know that we don't die and I, I can you know so I love everything you're talking about I I love it and it's just getting it from hearing it to actually practicing it you know because I think for every single one of us is terminal right <laughs> absolutely None of us are going to get out of here alive. No. And some just happen to get a diagnosis. Exactly. So how do we die beautifully? How do we die with the adventure? How do we, you know, how do we celebrate as we go out, even the pain and the uck? Yes. If if we live long enough to have a terminal illness that's going to take us out and we don't drop dead from a heart attack or a car accident or something, we, we get to watch our body decline. We get to go through the pain and the anguish and the physical stuff. I mean, mom was having paracentesis draining her bloated tummy every single week. You know, and it was, it was nasty. It was horrible. We were grieving as she was going. Yeah. And at the same time, at the exact same time, my sister and I look at each other in the midst of our hugging grief and we say, this is absolutely delicious. How can this much pain be so delicious? And we both agreed that it's part of our human experience. And if we don't embrace the pain and anguish as deliciousness, as we do love, we don't have the pain and anguish if we don't have love. If we didn't love mom so much, we wouldn't miss her so damn much. We wouldn't grieve so deeply. So the reason we grieve is because we love. Isn't that delicious? Can't I, we call those? Ah, oh, it's just. You know. I, I buy into that, and and I. But I've had some only a few times in my life that I've suffered physically with a lot of pain, and then seeing my dad on his way out with a ton of pain. I'm not quite at the delicious pain. I know. But I, I get know. it. I get it's part of life. I do. We weren't able to embrace my mom's pain as delicious. That was very hard to watch. Anyone who we were watching suffering, my heart just goes out and I want to help her stop her pain. That was very difficult. We weren't quite there. What was so delicious, though, was our own grief, was our feelings about what she was going through. So my sister and I are, are contemplating writing a book ourselves together called Delicious, How to Die Right. <laughs> wow. You know what? I want to play that song that you wrote f- oh, for your mom, that forever. Oh, yes. Can you, you tell us a little about it? And, and for our listener, it's just three minutes, but it's so beautiful. It gives me goosebumps. Uh, t- talk a little bit about that, because I think this would be the perfect time to, to play that. Yeah, mom was in rehab. She had fallen in the hospital and broken her leg. So she was no longer a candidate for chemo. So we kind of knew she was on her way out. And I was sitting in her apartment, just playing the piano, grieving. And the song came through, I wish I could keep you alive forever. 
And she and I had that conversation a long time ago, which is how this song was born. Mom, I know that you're going to die someday and I might, I might be left behind. What am I going to do without you? That was before I knew of what I know now. And she said, honey, I wish I could stay around forever, but I know that that's not possible. Can we? And that was the time she taught me how to pre-grieve. Can we grieve my death before I go so I know you're going to be okay? So when I was singing that song and it was coming through me, the words of peace at the last chorus came through. But I know all things will, must pass away. The constant in life is always change. And I am so grateful for today, forever. And that was what she taught me. So it's the last verse that brings me to peace. Because I know forever is possible. But it's not what it looks like for my, my human eyes. Mm. And I find for myself, this song is beautiful for all of us, no matter what stage in your life you're in or who, what you're dealing with and what pain. I tell you, I, I'm going to play it now and then, and then we'll talk a little bit more because I want to hear about your book and, and the CDs that are so healing that you offer and your vocal coaching. So let's play the song forever, okay? Thank you. From heart forever I wish I could keep you safe and warm Forever But I know through trauma and pain We live through each drama and gain Perspective just beautiful oh thank you it's been a while since i've heard that song you made me cry <laughs> yeah you know it brought tears to my eyes too 
And I think oh. it's all good. Yes, it is. Grief is so delicious. Yeah, it really does show how much we love, doesn't it? It really does. Oh, it does. It does. It does. Well, let's let's laugh a little. Let's talk about yep. holy shift. Yeah, <laughs> holy shift. Holy, holy shift. <laughs> Everything's a gift. A spirit-led journey through illness into wellness. That's your book. Yes, That's your is. book. Available on your website, on your website, laurenlanepowell.com. And just beneath this episode, there's a link to her website, to Lauren's uh, website. So uh, tell us about your book. Oh, it's a culmination of my first cancer dance when I went within and asked, what do I do with this? Beyond having fun, I heard, publicize it, share it, every bit of it. And I started posting my journey on Facebook, asking for prayer, thinking, of course, it was going to be a part of my self-expression and very cathartic for me. Right. I had no idea what a ministry it would turn into on Facebook. So I was able to use almost every story in a diary form. And many, many of the comments that people wrote afterwards in the book. So the Facebook posts became a diary of sorts, and I would then expand on the ideas in the book and add many, many photographs, most of which are my father's. So the book is big, shiny, uh, full of color on every page. I'm dyslexic, so I had to write a book that I would read. Wow. And it's like a Sark book, mm -hmm. if I could dare myself, compare myself to Sark. But it's a pretty, colorful, and I can open it up into any page and get something out of it. I love those kind of books. And with the purchase of that book, this you get through you, but aren't, are you including a CD or something? Did I read I, that? Um, yep. If you get it through Amazon, it's thirty nine ninety five, and you probably get it a little bit sooner than you'd get it from me. Mm -hmm. But if you get it from me, you get a free CD, and I'll sign it. Aww. And the CD is my Chance to Heal CD, and those were the songs, that was the music that I used during my Chemo Dreamo treatments, uh, primarily to keep me in my peace, to take me through surrender, acceptance, forgiveness, release, gratitude, and peace in order to accept the chemo as medicine instead of believing it's poison and it might kill me before it cures me. I mean, right. that's online, for goodness sakes, all the nasty things you hear about chemo. Yes. Could not let that into my body. I had to transmute it, and the only way I could was by accepting it as medicine. One of the songs I sing now is Love Solutions, Making My Whole Body Whole. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Anything I can do to accept that uh, liquid as healing light energy and all during the actual drip itself I would play my chance to heal music through my headphones that kept me in the state of peace and acceptance and gratitude and I think I know that that's what allowed the chemo to be as healing as it was and I didn't have any side effects I never got sick wow. I lost my hair I rock being bald let me tell you. <laughs> I would think so. I saw you with all kinds of colorful wigs, too, when you had your I'm chemo so dreamo treatments on your dream. site. But absolutely. But I never got sick. I never threw up. I never lost my appetite. Wow. I never anything. I think I only was kept from doing chemo once because my uh, blood count was too low. But even having a low blood count, you would think I would be susceptible to anything around. I never got sick. Three times in a row, 18 chemo treatments, three different times, <clears throat> I never got sick. And I really think it was because of the peace I allowed myself to be in through the music. Yeah, I mean, the opposite of that is fear. No and, kidding. And, you know, to hear all these stories and it's just free. I, I love now knowing that there's a choice. <laughs> oh. There's always a choice. One of the things that I am starting to, I guess, announce to the world is my wanting to be somewhat of a chemo coach. 
I can now help others who are in the same situation learn how to sing, learn how to use their music, learn how to dance with it, especially the family members and the caretakers. Because yes. the last trip through chemo, I didn't have mom or dad this time. I had to reach out. I got to. It was an honor to reach out to my community and ask people to come and sing with and to me during treatment. I had about four or five people every single week in a private room sit and sing my songs with and to me for two and a half hours for 18 weeks in a row. Wow. I called them my chemo sabi. <laughs> I had people calling in from out of town on the phone. I had a videographer document it. I had my chemo sabi write about it afterwards, what their experiences mm -hmm. were. And one of, one of my best friends lost her husband 10 or 15 years ago to cancer. And he would say the words, here comes the poison dripping in my veins. Well, he did not survive. And she saw the difference in my loving and blessing and praying over the bag and putting our love and energy into the bag that was marked poison right. and allowed that into my body to be healing energy, and it was. That's so I really to just change. Everyone in my chemo sabi and everyone who has heard about my chemo sabi has changed. It's so just great. Hard. Lauren, on your site too, you have a bunch of healing CDs. Chance yeah. to change metamorphosis, chance to laugh and love, vibrations of forgiveness, good grief. What are those all about? Well, the chance to series mm -hmm. are the songs now that I have used with the chemo dreamo, with the chemo sabi, especially. Okay. The, the chance to change are the songs that I listened to it's an expansion of Chance to Heal. It doesn't have quite the same songs on there, but there's a whole hour's worth of music. And it's very meditational. And they're what have come through since the Chance to Heal CD. So they're a little bit new, still meditational, a lot of acapella, very easy music to listen to and to sing to. And while I was undergoing the drip itself, that's where I needed to be. Chance to Laugh and Love is what we listened to for the pre-meds. In other words, when the Benadryl was coming and the Ananasia meds and all that stuff, to get ready for the actual chemo meditative state, I wrote and then uh, performed together, all of us, fun, up-tempo songs, happy little fishies eating all the bad cells away, um, my love solutions making my whole body whole, I just got to love my body into my 70s, I mean, just all sorts of fun, up-tempo songs mm -hmm. that we could sing and dance to and laugh with, even getting the pre-meds, that put us into such a high, fun vibration that then when the chemo did come, we were ready. We were in love, we were in laughter, we had danced, and anyone who is even not going through any kind of treatment, it is just an upliftment of fun energy, songs around our perfect health and our perfect place to be, whether or not I'm actually there. It helps bring me there because it makes me feel good. And my Vibrations of Forgiveness CD are all the songs that came through when I was teaching the forgiveness workshops. They're very meditative. They Some of the songs bring me to my knees because perhaps I'm not ready to forgive yet, those songs kind of trigger me. Yeah. I mean, as I release is in minor, it's very haunting. And it talks about as I release every bit of my drama. And first and foremost, they were therapy for me. And now I'm learning how much they're helping other people, which is so exciting. How about metamorphosis? Metamorphosis is the only CD I have out there with no words. It's all the singing bowls with my voice on ooh or ah, lots and lots of harmony. Each track is a different healing mode, a different scale. So each track feels a little different in the body. I also have incorporated a uh, 
free note wing instrument, which is like a little xylophone. Mm -hmm. It's very meditational in and of itself. So it's vocal and with the bowls and the free note instruments, but no words at all. It's 90 minutes, I believe. People use that for not only longer meditations, but massage therapy and Reiki sessions because there are no words. If I'm only able to meditate for five minutes or so, one track will do it. Pretty cool. And how about Good Grief? Good Grief are the songs I've written about the actual grieving process. And because they're sad, mournful songs about loss, they perpetuate the tears on purpose. And that's so good for those people who can't find themselves to cry. Uh, when when my mom's fiance died at 36, she was so emotional, her tears dried up. She just couldn't cry anymore until I was diagnosed. And she told me that my diagnosis first was a huge blessing to her because it turned on her waterworks. And she's the one who taught my sister and I how precious it is to be as close to our tears as we always are because of how healthy crying is. It's just the flip side of laughter. It's so wonderful, a release of energy. So when she stopped crying, she knew that there was something missing in her life. And when I was diagnosed the first time, she started to cry again, and she was so grateful. Isn't that weird? So Good Grief does just that. Songs like um, What You Played Forever that still makes me cry. Yeah, me too. You know how healthy it is to get those out of my body. Yeah, grief, I do believe it's something we go through. And so many times people resist it and then it'll pop up. And, and I don't know if the more water works, the more tears, the more really sitting in grief will help us move through it faster. I really believe it does. I really yeah. believe it does. And I believe in such a thing as compound grief. What's that? If I if I don't grieve about something as a child, per se, and I have an experience later that makes me grieve, it's going to be that memory that I didn't grieve before that comes up to be grieved. I believe it's an absolutely necessary act to cleanse our body, to acknowledge we're disappointed, we miss something, we're upset, we're mad, whatever. And so grieving the end of an old life, when I got cancer, I knew I wasn't going to be able to go back on the road like I was. I was told that by spirit. I had to grieve, letting go of 12 and a half years on the road full time. I got to grieve, letting go of anxiety when I started feeling more peaceful. Mm -hmm. It's weird. Anything that I'm used to that is ending... I must grieve, even if it's something negative. If I'm used to it, it's part of my body, it's familiar. Even if it's negative, like the sorrow, like the anxiety, if once it's gone, there's something missing, I get to grieve that. And it's curious. I mean, I, get to, I have to grieve the negative stuff too? Well, if it's been in my body and it's that familiar that it creates a loss when it's gone, yes. Incredible. I had a guest on not too long ago, and I loved something that he said, And um, but it was all these times of suffering and sorrow and grief and all these different ex experiences, as much as we may feel that they're negative and we don't want to have them. But he says each one is like when you cross over having, a, you know, being the prize winner of a mega million dollar lottery. You know, mm -hmm. the more we experience that, the the more benefit it is for our soul and it was just a, a neat way to to think about it you know not like i'm a victim of this but i'm a winner you know and yeah it might hurt right now really bad and i might not understand it but in the big picture because we do go on it's a gift yeah so more gifts how about um because this interests me. I've always wanted to learn to sing, and I, you know, sing in the shower and sing in the car. But you actually have a, a CD set that you teach singing, 
and you're also a vocal coach. I just want to share all the ways people can oh, I appreciate that. utilize <laughs> you because I think I'd like to be your friend forever and ever. Awesome. I'd like that too, Sandra. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have a CD set with four vocal lessons and three bonus tracks with more advanced work. Um, you can get those in hard copy now through the mail, through my website, but even better, I have those all available on a digital download now. So Uh, you don't even have to get the physical copy. It's so much easier just to get it on your computer. And what I've added now on the computer that's not available in a hard copy is a practice guideline study guide, which has very important pertinent questions about how you feel about your voice today, how you feel about the exercises. It's more about the emotions behind how you are singing and how your throat is feeling and how your body is feeling to answer some of those questions daily as you go through these practices. So that's a, a, an added advantage of the uh, digital downloads that I don't have on the hard copies yet. But those are available online, and people are really starting to snap those up now, especially with the uh, Threshold Choir, and that's really exciting. Yeah, I love it. I, I, I go through some dark and dismal times, as positive I sound. I'm a human being, and there's ups and downs, and I just think, you know, instead of buying into whatever victim mode my brain might tell me or worrying about the future or the past, how about singing? <laughs> How about, you know, taking the time to, you know, direct my mind to something like, like that. So I think that's, that's a possibility. Song and laughter, because this is a girl that loves to laugh. Well, Lauren, do you have any closing thoughts? Because our time is coming to an end on this episode. The songs that we sing are the, are like the stories that we tell ourselves. Are we singing positive songs about love? healing energy, and life affirmingness? Or are we singing those songs that rip your heart out, those codependent, can't live without you type songs? Mm -hmm. When my mom was going through her cancer dance, I had to remember how she treated me growing up because there were times when the drugs made her crazy. And I remembered the phrase that she used when someone asked her how she stayed so close to my sister and I as a mother. And she said the words, let every thought I think, let every word I speak, let everything I do be out of love. So that became, let every thought I think, let every word I speak, let everything I do be out of love. And as I sang that song, and as I stopped singing that song, and the melody continued in my subconscious, that shifted my energy to the truth of who I am, that love that mom helped create. So singing is one thing. Singing very important, affirmative, life-giving songs, even about death is the second part to why I sing what I sing. Just beautiful, Lauren. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being our guest today. Oh, thank you, Sandra, for having me. This has been so delightful. I love it. It's it's a whole new thing, and I love that, embracing the new. There's so much new adventures we can take, and I'm really grateful that you introduced us to this one. Everything's a gift. Everything's a gift. And tell us your website one more time. www.laurenlanepowell.com Perfect. And anyone who, uh, you can scroll beneath this episode and see that link, or just simply go to wedontdieradio.com, and you click on the link for Lauren Lane Powell, and uh, just beneath, well, you'll see it in the description, is the link to her website and to her book i love it holy shift (laughs) for our listener i hope you have a smile on your face now as i do as a little parting gift just after we close the episode usually i have my own parting music but i'd like to play the two songs from lauren i wonder which she wrote was that the first time you were 
diagnosed yeah. yeah and then also we'll play again the forever song because it's just mm-hmm. so beautiful so okay. if you want to stick to the end and um and listen to those two beautiful songs very healing very inspiring very motivating um also I want to remind people that we now have a Facebook group. It's a great place to meet and mingle and talk about the things that we talk about on this show. If you're a Facebook user, simply type in We Don't Die Listeners in the search box, and that's us. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I'm so happy that I get to be your host on each and every episode of We Don't Die Radio. And I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on Earth is important. So again, listen for a few more minutes to these beautiful songs by Lauren. I want to thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. Sunshine be more bright Could colors of the rainbow Take my breath away Like they do here And could I see the fires glow When the driveway's covered in snow From the I wonder what it sounds like on the other side. Could angels sing more beautifully when they harmonize than I do with my sister? Could I tell her that I miss her in a song? I hope I hear my mommy sing along. I wonder what it feels like on the other side. Could love be felt more deeply than from my daddy's eyes? Could God's arms be more healing than the arms that I can feel around me now? And can I send my kisses to my lover when he misses me somehow? I wonder what it sounds like on the other side. I wonder what it feels like to Stay
could hear you sing this song forever But I know each chorus soon will bring Crescendos and perfect harmony And when this song ends we still will sing Constant in life is always changing